would you also tell me about the zombie myth, the zombie symbolically? Why is it so important today? Mm, um, why is the zombie myth? What is the zombie myth and why is it so important? It's difficult to exhaust that topic because there's so many ways. Okay. There are so many ways around it, but I think maybe just to one way to begin is just to say that it seems to be a, a just a perverted image of man. You know that it's it is a corruption of everything that makes us uniquely human, and the spirit or the notion of spirit that is a particular human endowment that we value so much that animates the thing about us that has some faint connection to the eternal. To that which is beyond just the animal and the instinctive, but that which connects us to the spirit, to the artistic, to the aspirational, all of those things that bind us and make us more than the sum of our parts is precisely what is polluted by the zombie. The zombie is basically an, an, a, 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 an inverse mirror image of all of those qualities because it is a perversion of all of those qualities. It's a, it is a, it's a degradation of culture it's a degradation of mind. It's a degradation of, of, um, of the idea of a person as a self-making thing that finds itself alive in community and finds itself alive in projects that exceed its animal nature. And the zombie is sort of a reduction of the human being to something mindlessly animal, something acultural, something that is aimless and disoriented, has no sense of purpose or meaning, no telos, no sense of real belonging, no sense of home in the world. And the aimlessness and vacuity of the zombie, and also the literal decadence of its body, is, I think, it's... I mean, I'm not, this isn't particularly controversial to say at this point, but it's sort of like a perversion of everything that we consider to be sacred about human life. Um, and, um, and so what John and I and Philip argued in our monograph, you know, several years ago and since then is the idea that the zombie is sort of a, a symbol for the meaning crisis in some sense. It is a, it is a mythogram. It's sort of a, a, an embodied representation, a decadently embodied representation of the loss of meaning, loss of that animating spirit, the logos that pulls together many into one and that makes a human being something, a, a creature of, um, a creature of virtue and a creature of value and a creature that seeks itself and seeks to become itself, become a self. You know, in the, in the Awaking from the Meaning Crisis series, it's it's interesting that you can say all these things symbolically and mythologically about what it means, but then you also have the the the, the, the strange facts that actually zombie is it in culture and movies and video games just really rapidly on the rise and the use of it, and then um, I even I myself find myself kind of fascinated with them, and then it, and in part zombies themselves are the kind of thing which are they are in a way fascinated curious about human beings. They, they they chase them they're actively trying to seek them out and get something but they can never they they, they consume brains but they can't ever understand the the richness of that human being and so there's in a, in, a, in a, for the zombie and then for me like trying to participate there's there, it's a myth a mythological kind of thing but you can't participate in it really but we, we so we we try and maybe even make more and more content using the zombie myth but where does it kind of end and mm. you know take us to a, a new place i uh i remember um mm. jp marceau is a kind of philosopher who's done work on metaphysics and he had a, a beautiful conversation with jonathan peugeot where he actually talked about having just series of dreams of zombies um and and the only and, and it's oh, it's it made perfect sense i'm like of, of course i mean if, if if it truly was a symbol of the meaning crisis and and for him grappling with the um, reductionist materialist metaphysics and and in fact the only way he could get rid of the dreams and start bridging them was by he himself jp marcel was kind of called to how does he bridge the science today with a kind of new religious metaphysics that could could ground the kind of understanding meaning making 
systems of our world today into something more. So that that's that's kind of why I asked about it. It's just even that stark example. Um, yeah, yeah, that's cool. I, I did see that exchange between uh, between JP and uh, Jonathan, um, and I think John sent it to me. Yeah, it's it is fascinating how like the symbol is remarkably prolific. It's also really resilient. Like one of the things that we thought when we wrote the monograph was that because what what you say about the zombie narrative is is right. Like it 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 the, not only is the zombie creature aimless, but the narrative of the zombie is aimless, right? And zombie stories are weird. They're 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 hard they're hard stories to tell because typically they trail off. Like they, there's a mm. there's a discontinuity. There's a slack. In and there's like a there's a slackness. To the zombie narrative often that has it trail off rather than conclude and there's an in there's an inherent inconclusiveness a lack of narrative closure a lack of kairos a lack of climax to narratives that involve the zombie and very much like the zombie itself has no concentering telos the zombie narrative also seems not to have one and you know the medium has been playing with variations on the story for a while some of them do but so many of them don't and so many of them end in this open-ended there, there's something profoundly unsatisfying about those stories and at the time when we were thinking about this the prediction we made which hasn't hasn't turned out to be true actually um was that it, the the whole myth would actually trail off too that it would exhaust itself, that we would get so exhausted with it that we would have to leave it behind and abandon it. And that hasn't really happened. Like, it's still going. Like, it really peaked in, like, the early 2000s, and then I thought, oh, okay, it's going to trail off. But it actually has maintained pretty well. And all they're doing mm. is just making more and more and more variations on it. Um, so uh. there's a prevalence, and there's, a, there's something very prolific about the image and the myth that seems to take on a life of its own and seems to have an almost archetypal presence in our consciousness or unconsciousness as you prefer and um so the idea that zombies appear in dreams is fascinating and it makes sense that they would because there's something the idea of a decaying human being is just it is such a profoundly viscerally evocative and intuitively comprehensible image that it doesn't need to it like it doesn't need annotation to describe what it is there's something viscerally and intuitively recognizable about that image that that expresses its implications so clearly, its symbolic implications so clearly. And obviously, you know, that's, there, there's a visceral level to that. And then there's a more, I suppose, overt religious, there's a religious overtone about, especially within Christianity, about the perversion of the resurrection, right? This idea that, that, the, the, that the body itself is a site of the sacred and that the resurrection of the body is also a renewal of the spirit's relationship to the eternal and that there's a binding that is affected by the myth of the resurrection a covenantal binding something absolute that makes human beings into what they are by purpose and the resurrection of the zombie of course is in defiance of all of that the resurrection of the zombie is completely purposeless and usually in the zombie stories there's no there's not even an explanation that's the thing that to me is so interesting about the zombie narrative is so often and i think in some ways this is the proper way to tell the story there's no explanation for why this happened and that i think the nebulousness of it the indecipherable narrative the, the the absurdity of it the indecipherable absurdity of why this has happened to humanity um is part and parcel with the form of the story because you could say the same thing in some ways of the meaning crisis right there are all there are many many complex arguments for attribution obviously john has made a very robust version of that he's certainly not the only one to have done that 
But ultimately, when it comes to the individual, however cogent our philosophical arguments are, for it, it still appears, I think, to each of us in the guise of absurdity. There's still a kind of a, a deep fog to it. And we can hear arguments that might give us an intellectual understanding of how we could have arrived at this place and what it is in us that commends us to it. But I think there's something unknowable about the state of it that is yeah. part of what's so vexing about it. Anyway, sorry, that was long. Yeah, me. good. <laughs> You bring up the absurdity. That's it, it. It makes sense that that's part of the the myth. But I kind of hadn't thought about that as much. And 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 do you think that that is something that is not just in the myth, but in our lives? Like I know you've 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 written and thought about Kierkegaard and kind of existentialists who who think about that. But that's you. Could, you know, people can point to that like decades or centuries ago as that tradition starts. But but how does maybe bringing in that tradition, it might be interesting. H how does that change in our, because our current time feels very, like in a way you can see the remnants of things decades ago of the of, of science and technology and, and, and how we're in a meaning crisis, but there's also a way in which, like it's, I mean, you could argue maybe there's a the transition points, maybe it's ending, the something is changing, uh, especially after COVID and um, maybe, you know, you see people like John Vavakey helping use religious language and trying to bring new worlds together. But um, it's uh, when you think about technology and our kind of lives today, it's um, like there's it's I'll bring this up. I mean, I was I was talking to an uncle recently. I had a day out with him and my, and my brother and, and he effectively doesn't use the Internet and and you know just as a flip phone and things and there is one way you, in which you can say oh he's you know he's disconnected from the world what's he doing why didn't he but then in in speaking to him there's something fascinating about uh the way in which y he has like a different eye of the practicalities of you know what should he needs to get done what kinds of things help the world run and there's a way in which the the techne of people learning very specialized skills and um yeah, going to universities, getting lots of education, and there's something amazing about it, but also kind of fragile. Um, and especially as someone who has grown up only kind of with, nah, I, I, maybe uh, slightly technology, like phones and things came only a bit later, but there's a way in which you are kind of thrown into this uh, environment of, uh, of, you're just going to have to deal constantly with new technologies. And, but that's not, it's not necessarily a burden because you're kind of so used to it, but it's, but that's even more so the strange thing that, you know, wait for other people, this wasn't like this, having to deal with new kinds of living circumstances, new ways of navigating your life and education. Um, there's, I guess I want to put my finger on, yeah, something even more that stands out about, I wonder how it relates to, to the myth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. The whole question of technology. I mean, Heidegger's thoughts about technology immediately come to mind. And uh, you even mentioned the idea of being thrown into it, right? That's a, that's a choice, a choice use of terms. And um, I don't know, I think it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to understand the state that you're in, because it becomes the whole of the world. And when you see the world and interact with it and interact with yourself by means of the technology such that it envelops the frame of your perspective and it conditions and moves the way that you habituate yourself, it becomes very difficult to understand it as a condition that's framing your experience and not just a feature of experience itself. You know, um, yeah. It's hard to understand something when it's when it's where you live. And if the technology is the place where we live, or if the meaning crisis is the place where we live, it becomes hard to use imagination to wiggle out of it because you don't know that there is something to wiggle out of. You don't know that there is anything prior. 
And I don't mean prior just in a historical sense, although there is that. But I mean prior in a vertical sense, prior in an ontological sense, which is this to say there's something that is not ontologically necessary about the state that is conditioning the way that I see myself and see the world and the way that I behave. And there's something even in the relationship to time, I feel, that's impacted by this. One of the things I find really interesting is w one of the reasons I really like to travel, like I like to, you know, I mean, I, I always love coming back home, but I really like to leave it too and go somewhere for a week and go travel or go to a new city or go discover a new place. Um, whether alone or, or with friends or in company or whatnot, is that I find that in a new place, I use, like, I use my phone way less. Like, I tend to put it away. Sometimes I leave it behind when I go out. Um, you know, I'll use it to look up certain things, but ultimately I'll make a very deliberate effort to not communicate as much with home and to really be in the place where I am and to really put aside, like, everything that keeps me constantly, constantly plugged in. And one of the things that I find is that my ability to pay attention to my surroundings goes way up. The interest I have in my surroundings, now part of that is the novelty of the surroundings, right? But even doing this at home, like I find quality of attention goes up. Time also seems to change. It doesn't whiz by, to use Jung Chul Han's terminology, it doesn't whiz by as much. It, there's a languor to time. There's a, there's, a ste there's, a, there's a change in tempo. There's a change in the tempo both to time and to attention and to the quality and the presence that I detect in the surroundings that I'm in. And I begin to remember, and there's like almost a sense of like, oh, I remember myself, which is not something that I could, like I couldn't tell you what I'm remembering. But yeah. there's some memory that I access, a more primitive memory, an older memory of what it is to just be a person in a body, in a space, to be a body in a space, and to feel it, and to have texture, and to make contact. And there's a, there's a sensuousness to it, and there's a, there's a vividness to it, and there's a reality to it. There's something more real in the experience when it's no longer constantly mediated through the impulsive connectivity of that technology, which isn't really connective at all. It's actually quite disconnective. And so this is all to say that sometimes it takes, it, it takes certain ritual, I think, to dislodge us from those forms of life that technologize our attention and narrow its ambit and focus and it takes like a really concerted effort. I, I come back to ritual. I think it takes ritual. It takes some mm -hmm. kind of ritual to dislodge us from a state that is framed in ways that we don't even understand because everything we see and pay attention to is presupposed by the framing. It's presupposed by the conditioning. And, and, um, and so it is with, I think, in some ways, that's the way to understand the meaning crisis too, which is that it's a place we live, it's aware, it's a state we live in, and it becomes impossible to imagine that this is a particular state because we don't know that we're in a state, we're just living. Mm. And there's definitely a connection, I think, between that and No, that. I, yeah, I, I, I really like that because um, I, think, I think in Jonathan Peugeot and, and Matthew Peugeot kind of, they talk about how in a way, I mean, time and space kind of do morph and shift if if, you, if you're working all the time and everything is kind of <sighs> the same that kind of th uh, that uh, that y they talk about how the modern world kind of becomes more s you know like space rather than time and it, everything becomes kind of um it's, it's it's funny because when you talk about when you actually take a a break from because the thing with technologies or you know consuming content is you feel like you're learning so much so you're like how why why would you why would you ever take a a break wouldn't that be disconnecting myself from these valuable things that I'm learning um but there's there's also a way in which times when I can't like on the sabbath or sometimes I I don't have a ruler but sometimes it just feels natural of I'm just going to I can't I don't know why I'm putting so much stuff in my head let me just 
have nothing and then it kind of feels like I, there's a, a nice but also disconcerting feeling of like maybe i'll just what is the point of all this learning and all this knowledge is there really right. <laughs> a need well, for it well well i guess and that that's i think that's a really good question like and then this is where the existentialists come in because the existentialists would say well the knowledge is weightless the knowledge whatever you're acquiring objectively by filling yourself with facts by filling yourself with trivia by filling yourself with propositions about the world there's a place for that but if you as a subject you as a self are not deeply implicated in the learning if you're not implicated in the things that you're learning then you're not learning and or or that the learning is valueless right that learning is something you know that you do with the the whole of your person in some sense Mm. and that and that filling your filling yourself with you know what are ostensibly objective facts about the world has absolutely no imprint on you no impact on you if you don't somehow become unto the very thing that you're learning if your interest in it doesn't draw you into action draw you deeper into yourself draw you deeper into the world and gain a sense of importance that involves you in some deep penetrating way in a way that has a stake in your existence in other words if you don't exist in the very things that you're learning then the learning is without purpose it's without meaning um, so we have a con we have like the the volume of information we have at our disposal is vast but i don't think that we're any more knowledgeable i don't think that we're actually any more resourceful typically because of it now i guess that depends on what's guiding the learning right like it's like if i'm trying to like fix up my apartment and there's a skill i really need to learn how to like you know i need to learn how to like install this cabinet and there's a youtube video somewhere that will teach me how to install the cabinet then okay all of a sudden it's like there's a there's an action there's an orientation there's a sense of purpose and a there's a deep involvement that i have in the practice of learning that puts a stake into my life and that i implicate myself in in some deep way mm. so it's not to say that there's no utility to the technology it's just that the idea of acquiring encyclopedic facts for their own sake, the idea that that's something that actually vectors us as people, it just seems not to be true. And I think that was, that was the point of the existentialists, and that was why people like Kierkegaard and Nietzsche were, even though they were so literate and adept as philosophers, also had a mistrust in philosophy to some degree, because, you know, it's like if this doesn't, if this does not, is not something that you become with your whole self, if this is not something that you are implicated in, then it has no existential bearing and it may as well be unreal. And, That's... you know, and, and a lot of philosophy, I mean, coming back to, we were talking before you started recording about philosophy and the perceptions that most of us have of it before meeting people who bring it back to life, you know, people like John and others who, have devoted themselves to try and reinvigorate what originally animated its purpose. You know, the objective orientation to philosophy is part of what has robbed it of its luster. And so the existentialists and the proto-existentialists were the ones who basically said like, what's all this for, right? This is the, if this is for the, uh, the, for the sake of the objective a acquisition of knowledge, that's not a real project. <laughs> that just makes us unreal. It, we vanish before a project like that because we're not implicated by it. Um, and I think that the idea that we have all of this quote unquote knowledge at our disposal, it overwhelms us with a surfeit of possibility that I think actually tends to make us more inert than 
embolden. There are exceptions to that, obviously, but it's like you have to have, you have to know why it matters. You have to know what your interest is before those resources actually become useful. Because I think if then if you don't, then they just overwhelm you. And I think they put a lot of, they just turn a lot of people upside down with sheer disorientation. That's my sense of it. I don't know. What, what do you make of this, Jack? Like, yeah. What's your experience with this? I, I really, I like that you say technology can be really valuable when you have a specific thing you want to do, but then on the other hand, it can kind of become an end to itself of, uh, it can be, um, I remember I, 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 and I, I still kind of do it to an extent of if I'm not finding enough satisfaction or deep meaning in the thing I'm doing, I'm like, okay, what, you know, can I remember the words? Oh, if I learned a new word, oh, no, at least I learned something. I'll, and then you like in this, yeah, Ian, Ian McGilchrist comes to mind the the left hemisphere. Then if I just grasp enough of the little parts, will that will that sort of make up kind of knowledge for me? But it but it kind of it's um it's funny because you talk about f- how philosophy can you know we we talk and any kind of field can kind of come alive for you if it's if if there's a reason for learning it and and that's why I liked Awakening from the Meaning Crisis by John Vivaki. Um and I think like maybe more learning should be towards a because we because in school it kind of sometimes feels like okay you're going to learn this subject and this subject and this subject and and but if there was like sometimes you actually we try and almost remove it of like value of like it doesn't matter which teacher you have uh, you anyone could learn this because you're just learning history and we're trying to be objective but in a way like awakening from the meaning crisis where john viveki is not really objective actually no he's coming at it from a stance of his experience and his deep understanding of cognitive science and philosophy and then he takes you down a journey and and so yeah you could say it's not an objective understanding of the philosophers he introduced you to but 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 how else did you ever the only reason i got interested and started reading some of the philosophers he he um mentioned would 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 be what's through that um uh, yeah. yeah yeah i really I, I think it's really astute of you and i appreciate you saying that because i think that gets lost and it's kind of there's a danger in listening to anybody's account john or anybody else's account of things and imagining that you're encountering some kind of objective um some ob- objective account of the the state of the world as though it were presented by the cosmos itself. It's like, no, it doesn't work that way, right? The, 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 the knowledge that we bind ourselves to and cultivate and develop and refine into argument or into art or into whatever form it takes is ultimately vectored through the powerful subjective sense of interest that we have and the particular perspective and its invisible motivation. Sometimes the motivations are visible, sometimes they're invisible. Usually it's both, I think. And that doesn't make whatever it is untrue or unreal or valueless. It just means that it's a pers- it, it, is, it is a kind of reflection of and an extension of a person's personal encounter with a fundamental question, right? Everything in John's work is his encounter with a fundamental question that moves his spirit. And that is true, I think, of any proper philosopher who undertakes the projects of, of learning, which is that they're, they're moved by some thirst, some longing, some desire. And it's the desire that moves them that is in some ways the thing that is most real and that is actually expressing itself through the various forms of argumentation or through, and that doesn't mean the argumentation is not rigorous and that it doesn't have all kinds of refined systems of justification. But it also means that there's something at the heart of it that cannot be reduced to to a calculus. We are all still human, all too human, right? Nietzsche. And that you can't, you can't take that out of the person. If you take that out of the person, you take that out of the work, then it loses, then it becomes zombified. Going back to the zombie. Yes. That's when it yeah. becomes zombified, aimless and decadent, and no longer has logos, no longer has a, a unifying principle. Um, yeah. Anyway, and that's well, well noticed. And that's kind of one thing I wanted to 
that makes me think that objective some objective stance of of your knowledge kind of wouldn't really make make sense and i come at this from a personal angle of actually doing podcasts and you know doing a decent amount of them now and, and speaking to someone about about different topics and you know not even just you know listening to it it's it's much different than that because i'm having to think about all the different possible routes a conversation could take and you know what am i going to say and like you know um just not to say anything completely stupid and just just anything that might progress the conversation is actually difficult and so i'm really having to grapple with what someone else is saying and and then what i've i found sometimes is that if i start like talking to someone about a topic which i haven't say really discussed in my podcast so i don't know that much about there's starting to feel like i just hear like a, there's just this feeling of like what am i saying and like i'm saying something about oh the economy oh yeah the government should, shouldn't do this and i'm like i mean it's it's weird because even after doing four years of economics i, sh- I feel like oh, i should have some grip of this so you know but like what but why does my opinion as i speak it aloud just ring kind of hollow of like what do i and that's something i feel like with our culture and consuming so much information we kind of it's it, we can feel like we have uh mm. enough and that we're we're well informed enough but uh but then it kind of doesn't i remember i remember jordan peterson writing about this in maps of meaning and he had like a series of exchanges with his father about this of how he eventually he was he was just kind of like i don't i'm having to just speak less i don't know because w- all these opinions that i have are kind of from others it feels and and uh and i don't that probably happens maybe in I feel like that in series sometimes you or you, you think oh because you also need to have a way in which you take on other people's views but that's and take on the information that you like again like to be enculturated and to like we kind of have to first sometimes maybe grapple with things in a kind of there is a, a maybe a need sometimes to kind of take in information in a rote way before you can yeah totally totally yeah and I, I yeah you're absolutely right and i don't mean to say there's no place for that um but again it's like it's 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 an instrument right you like it's an instrument that you can learn to play and hopefully that you learn to you learn to play the instruments well um and you learn to read music and you learn to listen for it but ultimately, it, in some ways, it's a different question from what's actually moving you to play it, to listen to it. What, what yeah. is it in you that loves it in the first place, right? And um, so it's sometimes I think we confuse the categories of these things and we mistake the process for the thing that guides the need for it in the first place. Um, I, you know, I, I'm curious to know, I want to ask you about your relationship to economics now after having studied it for four or five years. And what what is it that moves your relationship to it? But before I do that, I'll, I just, there's a little, something came to mind as you were talking, which is that I have a, I have a really good friend who's a geologist and um, and a very accomplished one. And, you know, we've traveled a lot together, he and I, and inevitably we go to places where, you know, there are a lot of rocks for him to look at. And it never ceases to amaze me how he just becomes absolutely absorbed in these rocks. And, like, there's something almost, to me, because I, you know, not to say I, I couldn't be less interested, but I, you know, I'm not all that interested. And I mean, I look at them and say, wow, they're beautiful and there's something to be appreciated. But like when he gets into like the technical details of how they form and like, I it just, he just loses me. And, but there's something to him that's so absorbing, so absorbing about the technical detail of the process, the natural processes at work in creating these formations and earthquakes and volcanoes and things like that. And to me, it's sort of because it's so, it's so dissociated from, from 
the hum from the from the from humanity and from a, a, an anthropocentric story. There's something about that that disengages me. And, but he's so engaged, and I was trying to get to the bottom of like, what is it that keeps him so interested? Like, why is it that he can spend all of this time like looking at rocks? And one day he, well, he, and so I, I pressed him on it. One day he told me, well, it's like he, he said, and he said something that is profoundly, hum, a, hu, a profoundly human thing to say, which is that, well, it's the story. It's the story. Rocks tell stories, right? And if you know what to look for, you can see the story of how this came to be. It is an mm. interest in a narrative origin. And the projection and expression of narrative, of story, is a profoundly human instinct and capacity. But he has this relationship to the subjects of his study. And the relationship is a profoundly narrative relationship. It is a relationship of a storyteller. And as soon as he said that, it was like, oh, I get it. We're not different at all. Like. The subject or object, however you choose to frame it, is different, but ultimately the sense of investment, of personal stake, of personal implication, is, is realized by way of there's still a myth. There's still a yeah. myth of origin. There's still a story at the center of that work, even though there's all of this scientific and technical apparatus that goes into understanding and confirming and theorizing about that story it is the it is the deep desire for the story that actually moves the interest and all of the scientific work comes after the fact of the fundamental central interest in uncovering the story and um anyway so i thought that was yeah, yeah. telling and so for me that became like a way of understanding how there's there's a foundation that at the bottom of, of all of our projects mm. that is pre-reflective and that moves them. And sometimes the thing that moves us is invisible to us. In his case, he was conscious of it. Um, anyway, I say all of that. Um, I'm curious to get, you, you seem to have sort of a reaction to that. So I'm curious to know what that is before I ask you about the economics. Yeah, but yeah, because I could, let's see if it, become, it comes back to economics, but I just, it's something I've thought about with um, science. Um, like, yeah, you know, even someone obsessed with geology, it's it's in some way, there's also a beauty to the, the technical details, but it's, it seems to be when it's incorporated to the end of, yeah, understanding the kind of moreness to the situation. You didn't realize how cool this situation could be. Um, and because um, I... I think with with science, especially as it becomes mathematized and, and economics has, has, has done that uh, and, and more technical and data driven. I mean, there's something amazing about data, but there's also a way in which you're kind of removed again and again as you average things from like the experience of like a person on the ground. And DC Schindler has a, has a great example in one of his books of some psychology student and their they're asking patients about questions about their lives, but then they have to put a numerical answer and then someone else <laughs> is going to use that data. And then, and then, you know, then they're going to make judgments. Oh, well, you know, and they, and then it's like, how am, am I sure that this is really representing someone's kind of life here? And I guess what I want to kind of get at is that I feel like there's also a way in which you talk about the beauty of narrative when you t understand the details, but there's also a way in which we can't agree on the on good shared narratives in a lot of science such that i feel like we play endlessly with the technical details and then make them the end in itself of can we produce the the most elegant model of something and and that kind of yeah a lot of economics can then kind of it just doesn't make me feel connected to reality. I'm like, I mean, I could spend all my time trying to understand this model, but I actually don't know what this would help me understand about the world. But I'm, I'm also sometimes like, if someone can understand it, then go right ahead, use it, have fun with it. But there's a, 
and that's I think when I think about what brought me to economics in the first place, it's a it's actually a, it's a very strange field because it sometimes kind of feels like the science of of just thinking about the of the real world, and and you can think about huge systems to you know microeconomics to individual people. It's like what incentives, what dynamics are here that we're not seeing. So in a way, it's a, a strange field that isn't really a field. I mean, economics to economize, it's kind of about the relations between things ultimately, in which case there is kind of a beauty to going, if you understand it well, oh, no, I kind of, like, let's not, before we jump in and say, oh, these people, these, you know, there's there's some good work of, like, trying to understand, like, um, medieval trial by combat or just, just strange scenarios and you, you can like kind of dismiss people of like well, why were they doing that but if you take an economics lens you can try and give explanations for why people are doing what they're doing and so there's actually a way of you're know, not dismissing people's perspectives and uh, and it can become really helpful for giving you a, a lens for understanding things but there's yeah, there's a way in which we can't kind of ag- agree on. I don't know if it's the world at the moment. It just you gets more complicated. What you know, how, like as we've talked off the air, I kind of mentioned. You know, it's interesting to ask questions like, "What is the economy?" Right? Mm-hmm. I'm talking about using the tools of economics, and that's really helpful. But at a certain point, when you you know, when you try and we try and say, "Okay, well." us it gets back to kind of maybe even what we were talking about us as situated humans um we start the the world we live in becomes the water we're in and we can't step back from it so there's a kind of uh almost irony to economists trying to talk and about the world and say you know this is what's happening this is what one must do when the economics the, so, the sociality the politics of it all is like how how can anyone be objective about what exactly is going on when it kind of is directly impacts people's lives and it's it's um so so close to you and yet so complicated and in a way distant um so yeah that's kind of what i have to say there um that's good that makes a lot of sense that makes yeah. a lot of sense yeah, you approach it very thoughtfully, and uh, and yeah, it is a really good example, isn't it, of us participating in something without fully knowing the nature of what we're participating in, and being moved by something without fully knowing why, and and being uh, in some ways there's like a relational field that we are part of, and we don't always see it. Right. We're moved by it, we're guided by it, we're guided through the particular pathways that it lays out for us, but we don't always have a sense of what we're existing in. And then the idea of taking responsibility for that, the idea of waking up to that, is then one of the great philosophical projects um, of questioning calling into like you know again in that Heideggerian way right like ca- calling into question w- the wear of 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 the state we live in calling it in a fundamental way into question wait what am i in what has me a colleague named taylor barrett who's very who who invokes this question a lot and i really like the question like i like the phrasing of it like what has me what am i in what am i in that i don't know that i'm in and that is in me, therefore. And um, that can that question can be directed as specifically or as generally as as yeah. you know the situation demands. But like, what has me? What am I in? Where do I live without knowing I live there? And what do I believe without knowing I believe it? And these are like the fundamental philosophical questions that I think then throws a person back. On whatever moors them and and then all of the relationships all of the attachments all of the affiliations all of the activities everything that we're participating in day over day is then called into the same question which can be profoundly disorienting and if it's asked without the right footing 
can really throw a person off, which is why there's danger in doing philosophy. But, you know, the danger is sort of necessary if you want to call that into question in some fundamental way. And I like your invocation of economics as being a good example of a system of relationships that direct our hand and actions without us fully knowing why. And I've often, I don't know, it seems to me that economics, qua economics is sort of downstream from psychology um, insofar as it's ultimately a, an emergent consequence of how people behave and relate to themselves and relate to others and what guides, you know, the force of human interest and, and whatnot. But, um, but then these questions invoke the systems just as they invoke the individual if we consider one to be an extension of the other. I, I'll, I'll phrase this as a question about w how your work on the meaning crisis has kind of changed you, but I kind of wanted to first, because it's related on how it's kind of changed me, because I really like you saying that philosophy is kind of dangerous. You have to, if you really drink it in, it kind of must change you. Um, and you, I mean, mm, I I've like been that. actually... It's like a poison almost. Like some, <laughs> think of Socrates with the hemlock, by the way. Mm. I like the phrasing that you use for that is really provocative. <laughs> this idea, it's a poison you drink that your body has to metabolize. Yeah. Well, I, I, I say that because I've actually, as part of my um, degree right now, I've been working on the confirmation bias and thinking about what's, what experimental study could we do to try and understand it. We actually kind of gave up on it because it's so hard to understand, but then it's really fascinating why would people not change their beliefs and it's in part it seems, you know, we, we stand on ground, we stand on priors about how to understand the world. So to pry up a, a puzzle piece of how we understand the world, you, you genuinely need to be careful because if you have nothing to put in its place, then how do you go and act uh, and move forward? Which is why it needs to have great care in, um, and, and so to, to link this to, my when i watched the meaning crisis for the f my cleaning crisis and, and even now to a lot of the extent when i learn things i mean s sometimes this kind of i do want to just take in all the facts because there's something enjoyable about having a kind of system or now i under I, s I have all these things that i can use and wield um but uh there's been a slow way in which I'm like, if I'm going to be learning about flow states and perspectival knowing and new, f uh, like, what am I actually doing just learning about these things? Um, and there's, like, recently, and I don't know why I've been pulled to it, but I've, for example, just been doing way more salsa and judo. Um, these just, just these just activities I happen to be doing, but there's some way in which you're um, having to navigate these these scenarios, these patternings, um, and uh, it's kind of like what am, I, I, in a way is this is this not a kind of like deep way a kind of a learning of a train a training of my body to find new patterns of way of ways of doing things and there's a especially for me we're constantly thinking about concepts and language but to have there be a kind of right and wrong just obviously in your embodied environment. You know, did you throw someone correct in judo? Did you execute this salsa move? You know, well, there's a kind of uh, a, a lack of need to go, you know, argue about whether this was a good idea or not. There's and and again, I don't know if this this has been really interesting for me. And so, anyway, all this to say, I wonder, um, and it's kind of you know, yeah, a big question. How how does what you've even you know your even for your degree in your education have you have you changed uh, over time mm. now all i want to do is ask you about salsa and judo <laughs> you can so um, <laughs> just because it's a pheno like a phenomenally interesting pairing and it seems uh, to me that both yeah. but there's also like a the, there's the, a real the, correspondence the, between those two things because yeah there's like an attunement to another person, a, a one other person that is incredibly acute and um, and just the like the absolute imperative of being able to co-regulate with another body 
whether it is to coordinate with them or to take them down. And also the profound sense of timing, the, um, and the, then the confrontation, like that's another thing about it. There's something so profoundly confrontational in both of those things. I remember I got so into like whenever the last summer Olympics was, <laughs> I got, and I had never had much contact with judo before, but I had just started to do Aikido which I did for the last couple of years, which is not the same, but has some similarities. And I got so obsessed with watching judo because there's like the existential confrontation of just walking out and knowing like either I take this guy down or he takes me down. But there's also like a real, a stateliness to the art form as far as I could tell and something really sophisticated and elegant about it. Anyway, I don't know. I just was so yeah, let me, it when I when let me, I let me, watching it. So let me I'd say be more, to know, like, yeah. I'll, I, I'll go back to your question, I promise. But I'm yeah. curious, like, if you could talk about just, like, what your experience of these two things has been and what kind of connection you've sensed, if any, between them. Yes. it's. It, I think it might help, um, actually, in a conversation. Because, you know, the reason why, actually, I wanted to just do some kind of dancing after doing judo, which I just happened to do. I just wanted to try something new, and I ended up loving it. Is Me and my friends were just training and then joking around, like, when we're, like, practicing these throws does it kind of kind of look like we're dancing and so we were kind of almost just dancing impromptu like okay what are we doing and you've st people like stop stop doing that um, but then I was like I need to start dancing there's some way in which hmm, I wonder you're training and moving your body but in an environment that isn't fighting people um, and yeah there's it's funny because I think I they might be mutually informing and helping me improve in both in the sense that in judo you don't you feel like there's a bit of like a less care you need to give to the other person since you just need to beat them whereas in salsa you have to care for the other partner because you're you're in a way a team doing this dance together um but then it's making me go well how sure am i that if i go back to judo how sure am i that i don't need to care as much about the other person and it's just giving me a greater sense of okay actually and then similarly um the kind of maybe the danger and the the intense focus of salsa of like they could do anything to you know take you down so if you know if you're not ready for what what the possibilities of what could come up applying that to salsa is kind of like okay like there's there's also a way in which you can think about it as being rote but then how can I be more attuned to the changing dynamics of the situation I mean I haven't thought about it uh, uh, that much but there's uh it's uh it's it's funny as well um, you talk about the confrontation you know you watch people doing judo and I felt that doing I've done a few competitions and there's something just terrifying of you know you're like mom please help you know like you do it and there's no <laughs> turning back <laughs> yeah you're like alright you go you know you, you don't want to do it you have to you try and and uh, yeah there's it's um, I, something yeah. beautiful <laughs> the, the thing that the thing that really astonishes me about it is that and you correct me if I'm wrong, because I've never actually done judo, but but in watching it, the thing that I find so like fascinating about it is that when you're walking out to your match, especially in competition, I imagine, you know that the match has to conclude in one of two ways. Either like you take the guy down or he's gonna take you down. And there's no like when you go out and spar, like I used to do karate for many years and when you go in sparring competitions, it's points, right? Like you score points, but you're both on your feet the whole time. And in some ways there's a there's something less visceral and more artificial about winning a sparring match because of the way that it's scored. It's not to say it's not confrontational, it is. But there's also like an, the overweening presence of culture that is setting the rules. But it occurs to me that in judo, there's something way more primal and fundamental about the reality of either being put onto the ground or putting the other person onto the ground. And to me, the, like the existential power of that is way higher. It's way more ratcheted, in, at least in my imagination. So the, the, the joke that you made about like, oh, mom, please help. Like there's the, 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 the pressure of it, the weight of it, the fear of it. Um, I don't know. There's something profoundly courageous yeah. about judo that 
I think is not present in all of the other martial arts necessarily, mm. at least in competition. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting because it helps me contextualize the strange feelings that me and my friends find as we, yeah, we step out and do things. There's a way in which, like, no matter how much training you have, there's also because you're having to take each other down, there's not really, you can't really defend um, in judo because, yeah, you'll, you, you have to kind of attack. So it's like, you know, what are you going to do? It's like a call to action. Um, and, uh, I mean, you can you can pin you get can can get pinned or choked or you know be in an arm lock and stuff you can lose that way but that's that's even that's still bad um that's 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 even more like I'm on top of you know on top of me and and now I I lose so that's that's kind of a, you can kind of you know I guess you could like try and stop struggling and but yeah it's it's a it's a it's a funny one um it's again I mean. That's what uh, the reason why I've been doing so much like salsa recently as I made my term ends and I'm going into like a holiday is like there's a there's a way in which like I could I could sometimes I feel guilty I'm like you know I'm doing this in the evening I should be you know do, start, you know, doing some you know constrained minimization you know math questions but then I'm also like I feel like I'm learning actually way more this is way more difficult especially if I'm having to talk to someone as I do it I'm like this is like my worst nightmare like this <laughs> <laughs> so this is you know, like I'm I'm terrified of talking to people in general and now, and now I have to what dance with them and not embarrass like... myself <laughs> thank you <laughs> maybe less so with um with the attractive woman um but uh but yeah that's that's the, <laughs> very painful salsa but yeah but 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 again like I, I'm like this is my it feels like my dojo I'm like now I have I have to go and like it's teaching me so much <laughs> um dude I think it's that that's beautiful I think it's I think the instinct is right it probably is the single most valuable thing if I am if I could be so presumptuous I would say it's the same <laughs> of myself or of anybody it's probably the single most helpful thing that you could be doing is the combination mm. of those two things. And I imagine like the things that are acquired in salsa and in judo will inevitably find their way into everything else you're doing. And I think if there's one thing I've learned in the last, especially the last several years is that so much of what we take to be contemplative happens in the body. Mm. And um, that's just clear. Like, it's just clear that it does. And to be disconnected from the embodiment and, you know, I mean, obviously this is like one of the tenets of Hori cognitive science, but it's also just a tenant of attentive intuition. When you look at your life, it's like, these things are absolutely vital and they're vital in ways that we don't even fully understand or appreciate. And the balance acquired in one domain will lend balance to another domain. And I've experienced that sounds like you have too and i've heard so many accounts of this and so much evidence for it at this point that it's almost at the level of a truism which is that you know whatever we cultivate with our bodies will ultimately find its way into the life of mind mm. because there's no separation we just take there to be and um anyway there's something just so powerful about the combination of salsa and judo that's just so fascinating to me <laughs> and the idea that you're also undertaking these forays into philosophy, these forays into these various domains of thought and science and economics in tandem with all of that movement and the confrontational nature of that movement is sounds like a, just a profound mm. and rich recipe. And it's commendable that you're undertaking all of these things in tandem. It's really good. It's like good for the soul. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's funny you bring up the embodied nature of like thinking in general um, you can't, because I think you talked to Seth Dillinger, um, a Feldenkrais practitioner, and he, he's great because he's helping me think about, you know, you think, say, coding at your computer or something is just a, it's a, a mental task, but I've been even thinking about actually just navig navigating computer screens. I mean, is it like, the thing which taught me, I think, so much actually about these kinds of things is having shoulder injuries and surgeries and like mm -hmm. being you you don't think that why why would not being able to use your arm like but you feel like able to do less and in a way it's kind of real I mean you're actually just physically like less able to make food as easily or just do the tasks which you naturally thought you could do and it's like oh I'm this vulnerable kind of creature and it does kind of constrain what you think and find you're capable of mm -hmm. and and 
so again, I, it's, I'm because I'm not good at things like salsa or judo, but we're tr- we're trying. Um, but there's a way in which maybe it is helping me kind of like navigate uncertainty and be like, you know, oh, I've just, you know, because you get some email and you're like, oh, you know, you're, you're kind of thrown off. Oh, wait, that's a wrench into this or that plan. And, you know, it's like, actually, it's kind of a, you think about even just the day, you know, working at your desk is kind of like host of bodily sensations and things you're having to grapple with and how does your posture change or things as you, <laughs> as you do things. Um, and, uh, and it's, you know, I think Seth Dillinger would t- talk about, imagine you're, you're a philosopher and then you have like a pain in your neck all the time or something. And it's like, I mean, obviously that's going to sort of infiltrate the way you kind of see and understand the world. Oh, yeah. You can't, yeah. Yeah, totally. It becomes the adverbial way that you experience the world. You, know, you experience it posturally. You experience it painfully. You experience it, you know, thirstily. Like whatever the state of your body that also becomes the state of your affect and your mood. And that mood becomes the mood of life. It becomes the way that the world presents to you. It's backlit by a different shade. Um, these, are, these things are so profoundly interrelated. And uh, yeah, it's like what you do with your body. It really, it really matters. And um, um, there's also just the sheer courage of undertaking things that require, that put demands on your body that just matures you in ways that like no amount of intellectual rigor possibly could. And that Mm. courage also transfers over, right? It becomes a global virtue. It becomes a global capacity. Um, You know, a confrontation, I imagine, like the kind of confrontation you have dancing with an attractive woman or facing down some guy on the mat will inevitably I think it will inevitably resurface in the other domains of your life when it is called forward, when you need to call upon the same courage and tenacity and face down something that's novel. Those things are are profound exercises of conditioning that capacity, Mm. I would imagine. I can't can't see how they wouldn't be. Yeah, there's something I kind of wanted to ask you about. I remember in the series you did with the, on, on the elusive eye, you talked. You had some. You just had some just amazing things to say about character and how the ways in which we we're given. So everyone doing a lot of work on personality theory and bridging that with economics, uh, and the the way in which we're given certain biological attributes and like we have to intrinsically um, become and 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 we can only be who we are. Um, mm. But there's also a way in which that being calls us to adopt certain ki- kinds of armor and 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 ways of improving so that we can find and explore the right niches for the kind of person we need to be and the things we um, must do in my life. And, and the reason why I want to ask you about that is in you like pointing out like, oh, it's actually interesting that you do salsa and judo or something is that. Like other people have kind of said to me, oh, it's 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 weird. You you wouldn't maybe seem like the kind of person that would do that, and then I would, I would say exactly like that's kind of my thinking of it. I'm like since I'm, I'm I'm like the reason why I almost did it is like I just felt a need of like I'm not the person that does these kind of things. I better like almost throw myself into it, mm. kind of like the way I don't know like you go under a cold shower of like yeah that's precisely the point. That's it's the whole point is that it's not easy and you're kind of like training yourself and then but then in training myself to do things I don't want to do, that's like become part of me. So then it's like who am I? The person that doesn't want to do it or the person that does? <laughs> that's a great question. It's a deep question. Um mm. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's funny, like, you're right in that personality seems to be the endowment that we have by nature, the tendencies we have by nature. And character has something to do with the cultivation of how we become the thing we already are. The way I love it, the way I I really love to, to... to put this to myself is to steal a line from Shakespeare and say, like, to become what thou art by art rather than by nature. And 
that involves a level of consciousness and cultivation and purposefulness and refinement that reflects back on and knows and understands the things that you are by nature, but also creates a dialectic with those things. T personality is tendency, but it's not fate. Character is destiny. Personality isn't. Notice how the phrase isn't personality is destiny. The phrase is character is destiny, which is to say that, yes, you might have certain predispositions, Jack, that might not naturally dispose you to jump into salsa or judo, but by cultivating them anyway, you're creating a dialectic between the adventurousness of your activity and the default instinct that you have within you that predisposes you to certain things. And that tension between those two things is also very powerful. It's powerful to act against your predilections. And there creates a space between your predilections and your decisions that opens up a realm of possibility and virtue that opens up vistas for you that wouldn't be opened if all you did was just follow your preferences. Character is the relationship you take to the personality you have and the decisions you make in response to those endowments. And the decisions don't have to just follow in the trenches of your implicit attractions. They can also work against those implicit attractions in ways that cultivate higher orders of desire. The whole idea of existential free will, freedom of will contra freedom of action, is that it is about the inward coherence of the relationship you have to the creature that you are, such that the creature that you are can become unto itself in ways that it couldn't if it were a mere vessel of nature. You know, um, I think Jordan Peterson often likes to say that he he says he's he's high in agreeableness, and and then people kind of joke, oh, you're you're the person always arguing with people and you know, um, uh, going against things. But then, but there, but then the way he describes it is like, well, you see, being high in agreeableness, I know that if I don't argue now, mm -hmm. it's going to cause a problem down the line, and so I just know myself, and therefore I need to do it now. And that, that makes me think, like I've been thinking a lot about the phenomenology of different um, personality traits. And there's also a way in which in being high in agreeableness, on the one hand, you might say, well, that's going to predispose them to less conflict and things. But in having the kind of affordance landscape that allows him to understand what might disrupt the stability of social situations that actually lends him the sort of ability to see the ways in which one must act because if, the, to, if, if such a situation was to be prolonged into the future, it would cause more disruption. And so his actual agreeableness in a way called him mm. to act <laughs> less agreeably. And um, yeah, yeah. There's the dialectic. It's the same way that, you know, you can have a profoundly introverted person who's also profoundly sociable, right? And... Um, and and those these the, the tension of these opposites can can exist and in fact when that's cultivated there's some then incidentally it becomes ironic there becomes an, an irony to a person which opens up i think a spaciousness within them that allows for the contemplation elevated consciousness and then decision the act of ratifying oneself of consummating potential into commitment and commitment to ways of life that bind a person to himself, to others, to his own life. And the power of that decision, I think, has a lot to do with developing a relationship to your own predisposed personality that knows to strike tensions with it in order to make possible something transformative within you. And. Um, and obviously, all kinds of therapeutic modalities are dedicated to doing exactly that. You know, in many ways, that is sometimes the aim of a lot of therapeutic modalities, right? Certainly, depth psychology, analytic psychology, even some. I think even like the the you know the Stoic informed, you know, CBT, DBT 
practices, I think, in some ways are trying to do that. There's so, there's so much energy existential therapy. There's so much energy poured into the practice of trying to come into a proper relationship with your own natural predispositions. Not so that you can annihilate or erase them, as though you could, but so that you can have a relationship to yourself that is comprehending and that understands that you're you're always surfing a wave, you know, and um, you can't necessarily blow against the wind, but what you can do is, you know, you can learn to sail with it in ways that, um, that actually take you to, that allows you to put a particular destination in your crosshairs as opposed to just being blown about incontinently. Mm. And, the, and the final thing then, um, Christopher, you said you were like heading the Viveki Foundation and sort of your kind of changing, you know, what responsibilities you have and mm. and and what roles you have in, in life. So so how how is that changing you? How are you adapting to that? Yeah, thanks for yeah, bringing your question back. And, you know, I think in many ways, it ha my project has been very much the project we've just been talking about, which is like, you know, like like everybody else, I'm trying to figure out what where I should be what I should be doing, what my nature commends me to, and how I can use consciousness thereof and decision and a sense of more, um, a more deliberate sensibility to find the right relationship with this work that allows me to give most to it in a way that perhaps only I could do, puts me in service, makes me useful, um, and also is good for me, you know, feeds my soul and, and makes it worthwhile for me. And there's some place where those things meet, where the act of service meets the, meets the experience of passion. And, um, and like most other people, I'm just trying to find that place. And so, you know, taking on this role in the Verveke Foundation has allowed me to help support and incubate, you know, projects that are trying to extend and enrich and make more practical a lot of the work that John has started and that I and all kinds of other people have contributed to. And to see what potential it has to give when it's put into different formats, when it's translated into practices or into courses or when, I, when it's scaled into different settings. And so the Verveke Foundation really was started to be about that, to be about you know, how do we grow projects up and help incubate and refine projects that are inspired by this work that have something to give, whether it's a course, whether it's a video series, whether it's a set of practices, whether whatever it happens to be that performs an act of service that can be useful to people as an instrument to play along their own paths and their own quests and their own projects. It's not like, you know, it's not intended to be a, a center of life in itself. It's not intended to be a home or a community per se, or certainly a system of thought. You know, it's like definitely not that. It's like, it's, there's not, it's not like a series of ideas that I want people to be subscribing to. What I want it to be, and you know, in the longer term, you know, we'll see how this how this unfolds. But what I want it to be is a, a service, given in the form of different techniques and tools and instruments that people can use in the advancement of their lives and their own purposes. So I'm trying to find mine in this space. I mean, I've you know, I had a long career, you know, in public policy and other things that I left little over a year ago. I've been doing this work with John. I've been writing with him. I've had a foot in this world for long, for many, many, many years now. But this was the first time for me that I took my focus off, you know, other careers and occupations and set it squarely into this space. And that's been a very strange experience for me. It's been meaningful. There's been a lot that's been exciting about it. There's been some vertigo to it as well. And, uh, and it hasn't been long, so I'm still kind of groping my way through it in the dark. And um, there are so many things about it that I find 
incredibly enthralling and beautiful and interesting. It's put, certainly put me in touch with people that are really astonishing and that I never would have met otherwise and, um, and who I'm grateful now to know and you know who have, who have enriched my life already. Um, it also kick, just kicks up a lot of dust. You know, there's a lot of psychic energy directed toward the issues of meaning in life and philosophy, and that also creates a certain amount of chaos. Um, and managing that is also a, a very formidable, complex challenge. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been a fascinating process. But I would say for me, the idea of understanding the meaning crisis is a state that afflicts us both in ways that are general and very specific and unique to us, and that in some ways each of us has a very personal way of living in response to this state that we're in and waking up to it and deciding where we place our time and energy and attention that can bind our relationship to our own selves and lives more intimately that put us into proper service of where we belong and where we should be. You know, I don't really want to create a home for people to flock to. I want this to be a way of people finding the home in themselves. And that's a hard thing to do right now because the dissolution of institutions, the dissolution of traditions, the dissolution of community is a powerful problem. Um, but also artificially and arbitrarily creating community to somehow bring into cohesion hundreds and thousands of different competing ideas of what's valuable and real is also not tenable. Mm. So it's a really, f it's a, yeah, it's been an incredibly interesting process. I'm still learning my way through it, really. And there's been a lot of trial and yeah. error to it. There probably will be a great deal more. Um, but we're just trying to do our best. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Really thoughtful, really thoughtful questions. And, and it's been my pleasure just learning more about you and where you, where you are and things. And there's just, there's, it seems to me that there's just a lot to you. And, uh, and there's a real conscious, um, there's something really, there's something very cultivated about the way you're going about this and interacting with it that I really appreciate. I'm very thoughtful and that thoughtfulness comes through oh thank you well good luck in, in your work and your endeavors like I, i'm gonna keep following them um and uh and i hope we speak again so I, i'd like i'd like that let's do it <laughs>